Isn't blue orange pill is here for you, here for you, here for you. Woo, woo, woo. Ooh. Yeah, this one is in um, honor of Arthur Hayes, our friend. Who right now, you know, while we're recording this, he is remains at large, and I hope. Um, you know, you know, the interesting thing, Arthur Hayes, who runs BitMEX, we, Max and I met him before he started up BitMEX Exchange, and he told us about this at the Hong Kong Bitcoin meetup. I think it was 2013 or 14. And he said he was going to do this exchange, BitMEX, where you could do 100x leverage. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. And being a former Wall Street myself, I was aghast because <laughs> usually uh, getting a two or three times leverage is uh, really dangerous and usually ends up with huge losses. So 100x leverage. I mean, this is just rocket fuel to disaster. Yeah. Well, we still had um, memories of getting Zhao Tonged. So we thought, oh, who would want to do 100x? Because that's a way to get Zhao Tonged and lose all your Bitcoin. Well, you know, according to the charges and what we're reading right now at this moment and stuff could change, but certainly the indictment, it sounds like they had some sort of, they had impaneled some secret grand jury and he had been, or his company, BitMEX, had been negotiating with the CFTC for those civil fines. It it seems like they didn't know and expect these criminal charges to be laid against them. And I saw that Stephen Pally, who's a lawyer, was saying that they face several thousand Bank Secrecy Act violations, and each one carries a five-year prison sentence. So, you know, the the, the good thing for Arthur is, as we're recording this, and I don't know, you know, by the time it airs, we'll, we'll know where he is, but there's no extradition treaty anymore between the U.S. and Hong Kong because of the conflict, the Cold War emerging between the U.S. and China, and the U.S. Pompeo recently said that they were ending this uh, extradition treaty because of the, you know, that China has too much control over Hong Kong. Right, right. And what else? What else do uh, do we know at this point? So I was reading that approximately two billion dollars worth of Bitcoin is on the exchange and the exchange is protected by multisig. And the question is whether it's two out of three or three out of four multisig is required to unlock those coins. And additionally, if these folks are being uh, detained by police and don't, do not have access to their computers, et cetera, do they even have the ability to get together to do anything? I saw Jameson Lopp, who's uh, really the foremost expert on security in the Bitcoin space over there at Casa, our friends at Casa. You know, he was uh, tweeting out like, now we're going to see how resilient multisig is to a state kind of inquiry. Uh, that's an interesting, that's an interesting concept. One of the first things I thought of when the news broke was the feud that went on between Arthur Hayes and Nouriel Rubini about two mm. and a half years ago. They did a big event in London and um, Nouriel Rubini is you know, rabidly anti-Bitcoin, and he decided to pick a fight with Arthur Hayes in a big public way and accusing him of all kinds of malfeasance and wrongdoing. And, um, you know, Rubini is a, a made man, right? He goes to Davos, he's part of the elite, and he gets an audience. And I wouldn't be surprised if part of the urgency on the part of these regulators like the CFTC was not kind of instigated by Rubini's insistence. Well, he certainly was under observation by the FBI back in 2018, I think they said, 
when he went to consensus, remember we were there, he had all those Lambos out front. They mentioned the FBI investigation says that he got those Lambos in order to get press attention on thus, um, you know, circumvent the laws against him taking ads out targeting U S citizens. So he got the, the media to, um, do, it. but you know, we'll go into that. We're going to probably do a microdose special if we can about that fine, maybe Stephen Pally or, you know, some sort of lawyer who will come on and explain, you know, a, as we know more by the time this comes out, because we're recording this on Thursday. It airs on Sunday morning very early. Uh, Arthur could be in custody by now. We don't know. Or he could be uh, hiding out for good in Hong Kong. Ongoing story. <laughs> it is kind of interesting, though, that he does kind of predate so much of the uh, fines and penalties that were laid against subsequent uh, Bitcoin projects. And, you know, Arthur really is, I think, the first Bitcoin billionaire, really, before the Winklevoss twins and before anyone else. He, I think he was really genuinely the first one. Uh, but obviously, th the situation is, uh, looks, looks a bit dicey at the moment. Right. So let's, uh, let's go back to the positive, because in the beginning, in the beginning is the story. So it's funny because I did an event with a Magical Crypto Conference where I interviewed Adam Back, Dr. Adam Back, who in the beginning is in the Satoshi White Paper and mentioned there. And I was going to bring up this notion of how, you know, the, the Old Testament starts with the words in the beginning, the New Testament starts with in the beginning. And I was going to ask them, you know, I was going to lay out this pattern for him when it seems to like jump from my mind to the hive mind of Bitcoin, because there were, there was uh, several memes that went out about in the beginning and including RDBTC, who's always in the orange pill podcast telegram group. Ever since the beginning, humans have strived for a better existence. Bitcoin will take civilization to the next level of existence. He said, so, you know, I want to read those lines, like what I was thinking, what I wanted to say about in the beginning, because, you know, if we're in the beginning of a new renaissance, a renaissance 2.0, if we're in the beginning of an exit from a fiat dark ages, it's important to understand these sort of words and what they mean. So in the beginning, in the Genesis, in the book of Genesis, the Old Testament, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was out with and the earth, sorry, was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. So that was creating our material, physical world is created from the void, from the blackness. The New Testament starts, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the Word, in this context, means Jesus, that Jesus was the interface between God and man. He, w he came to tell them about God and what God meant. The next testament, and the testament is, of course, just uh, writing down or st statements of fact. In the beginning, there was the code. Cypherpunks write code. So this is a, a continuation of these evolutions from our pre, uh, from our, like this is a continuation of the development of human consciousness. Right, well, Bitcoin is the Holy Ghost, right? So it's the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's the triptych. And Old Testament, Father, New Testament, Son, Bitcoin white paper is the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost refers back to pre-Father, goes back full circle to the void, goes back to mm. squeegeeing or, you know, the etch-a-sketching and the reality to start with a blank slate, except this time the blank slate will be digital. So before it was material during the Big Bang and, 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 and the Old Testament, then it became, with Jesus, it became the Big Bang and the restart and the Renaissance really became one of consciousness, which was, you know, it's kind of became of age at that time uh, when we started to kind of realize we had a consciousness. And now we are at the Bitcoin, the Holy Ghost stage, where it's digital. So you go from material to conscious to digital. It's been an arc of our experience. Now, on one hand, it's very interesting because it portends uh, a new beginning, which is always exciting. Um, you know, it also is part of the whole cycle of things. So um, we're exiting one part of the cycle. And we're certainly in 2020 seeing a lot of political upheaval. 
and we're entering a new part of the cycle. That's what Orange Pill Podcast is kind of like the first podcast of the new cycle the, of the Holy Ghost, I would say. You know, we're the first across the line, and we're the first podcast to explore this post-New Testament reality. Well, that's a good point to, you know, turn to our sponsor, thesunexchange.com forward slash orange pill. And this is, there would be no new beginning for Max and Stacy here on Orange Pill Podcast without the Sun Exchange. Sun Exchange is the world's first peer-to-peer -peer solar leasing platform, earn Bitcoin solar power in communities in Africa, and be part of the new world economy. Visit thesunexchange.com forward slash orange pill and start monetizing sunshine today. Right. Well, we're actually going to do a Sats, Margs, and Orange Pill with Abe Cambridge over there at sunexchange.com forward slash orange pill, thesunexchange.com forward slash orange pill. And we're going to do a Zoom call with them. We're going to have cocktails, margaritas, whatever you want. Ingest as many orange pills as you want. We're going to do that soon. Uh, we're waiting for him to come back with the date, but keep in touch by joining orange pill at telegram.com. Yeah, definitely. The orange pill telegram group is really getting popular and a lot of people are there and the contributions to it are fantastic. And we're really at ground zero for this move into the post 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 post, um, spiritual dig into the digital new, new era. It's the post fiat dark ages, Max. That's yeah. what we celebrate here on Orange Pill Podcast, right? Because it's the beginning. It's the in the beginning was the code, right? There was the code. That's what happened. Because remember, if if you don't know it, the important words of Eric Hughes in 1993 in the um, the cypherpunks, what he said is cypherpunks write code. We know that someone has to write software to defend privacy. We're going to write it. So you know. We here on Orange Pill, we make content and we make content in order to, you know, defend our liberties and this new, the dawn of a Renaissance 2.0, because there are forces against this, against enlightenment, against um, heterodoxy. They want you to believe in the orthodoxy that is MSNBC and Rachel Maddow and all of the FBI agents on, on MSNBC as, as journalists somehow. <laughs> and so we're Right, here. so 13.7 billion years ago was the Big Bang. Yep. <laughs> That's the Old Testament. Yep. Then 2,000 years ago or so, we had the consciousness Big Bang. Yep. That's Jesus. Then in 2008, 2009, we had the white paper Big Bang. <laughs> which is digital, frictionless, perfect money. Yep. And that's the where we're at now. I mean, it's very exciting to be a part of the beginning uh, and say goodbye to the, the history. So I want to also look at some of the stuff that's been going on in the Bitcoin space this past week because there was a, a big collision between um, all these things happening, this fiat dark ages. Because when, when you end a, an epoch, like the fiat dark ages that we've been in for 49 years. Next year, 2021, August 2021, is the 50-year is the anniversary of going on to an all-fiat age. And as you end, as it crumbles, it's, it's never like, just like, hi, okay, we're exiting and, you know, have a, a joyful rebirth, have a new renaissance, have a new enlightenment, right? Like every single end of the age is like, the Renaissance also came about with the Inquisition, right? Like they didn't just like the powers that be didn't just give up their power willingly. They go down fighting. Right. Oh, absolutely. It's dynamic. It's explosive. It's it's uh, brilliant and beautiful and dangerous and exciting. Yep. And then the, in the when the Enlightenment happened, it's not like the French king said, "Oh, okay, you know." Just uh, let's all change. Or uh, the Tsar Nicholas in Russia didn't just like willingly give up power. And, you know, the same thing is happening now. So I'm going to look at a few headlines. And we're going to look at some information about this that's been going on, this collision between the fiat dark ages and the, the hardening of the Renaissance 2.0. And, you know, we saw Dick Costolo respond to a story this past week, which was pr quite amazing. First of all, he's the former CEO of Twitter, Dick Costolo. Um, 
it's pretty amazing to see anybody under 80 years old call themselves Dick, but that's his name. Right? Okay, <laughs> fine. That's nice. And they were responding to a story about Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong saying, basically, in you know the shortened version of it, is that Coinbase will offer a huge severance package if snowflakes want to leave, right? If you feel like you, you want Coinbase instead of being in a crypto exchange, if you would rather have them be... Um, you know, social justice warriors. Well, you know, I'm sorry, but we're not going to do that. And if you, and because we know you might feel unsafe and, and, and fragile, we're going to give you an unprecedented, huge severance package if you want to leave. Well, somebody responded to that first. Somebody at, at PT said, I agree the vast majority of workers want to be effective and supported professionally in an ethical environment. This will be rough for people who want an activist job on a tech person's salary, but life is about choices. If you want to get paid to be an activist, join a nonprofit. Dick Costolo, the former CEO of Twitter, responded, me first capitalists who think you can separate society from business are going to be the first lined up against the wall and shot in the revolution. I'll happily provide video commentary. Well, first of all, I believe he's violating Twitter's um, TNS in terms of service. For, that's my first th thought there. Uh, that's definitely worth banning right there, according to the terms and service of Twitter. But, you know, we haven't had any chance to chat about this at all. This is kind of a, something that's happening in a day or so. Uh, what, what was your thought about this? Well, my point is if I were running a company and I instead had a whole bunch of crying people in my office all the time saying that I should do this and I should go help the feed the homeless and I should also clothe the 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 naked and well, in the beginning, right? They're they're like they want you to be Jesus Christ. And you're like, "Well, Jesus Christ died for our sins and I'm happy for that, but I, you know, I don't want to die for your sins." And I I'm, I want a business here. I'm running a business. Right, but, there's another part to this also because Jack Dorsey at Twitter yeah. chimed in and criticized Brian Armstrong. So it seems like Jack Dorsey of Twitter, another Silicon Valley heavyweight, is taking the other side of the argument. So now this is setting up a clash of the titans. And But it also shows you how every single time there are genuine bad dudes in history that um, kill millions and millions of people, and they all start out exactly like that, thinking they are doing the right, they're right. Like when... when Slaughter, slaughter happens on the scale of hundreds of thousands or millions, like the Inquisition I mentioned that saw the end of the Dark Ages and the beginning of the Renaissance. Is like they thought they were protecting society. They didn't do it that thinking like, oh, let's torture this person because we're bad dudes. Like we, we're evil. They like genuinely believe like um, our power and control and authority is disintegrating because evil the devil has seized these people. So we must stop it. And of course they must stop it, right? If that's what they believe. And the same thing is going on here is like, they look at, at all the Republicans in America. And if there's like a hundred million that voted for Trump, they've delivered Hitler. Like they are the, equ the equals of the Germans who voted in Hitler. So we must destroy these people. So they all believe they're doing good, but now you see why, you know, it's hard to see who's good or evil at certain points right. in so history. So this guy, Dick Costolo, is arguing that the employees of Coinbase should be able to bring their political activism into the workplace, right? Yes. And, uh, of course, Brian Armstrong is saying, look, I mean, this is not consistent with our grand mission statement, uh, which would have to be laser focused on because it's very competitive in industry and we can't really don't have time uh, not even a minute of any day, you know, they have something over there, I believe it's called 996, which is you work 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week is kind of the work ethic over there. And there's just no time to do anything but their laser focus. You know, another thing that struck me when I read this was having lived in France for so many years, this is typically the French attitude is that work is just a place to go vent your anger. Mm -hmm. And if you get fired and you're back on unemployment, that's great. That's the goal. You know, the French attitude, just to give you an idea of the contrast here, is that work is something you do in between vacations, mm -hmm. right? In America, it's different, right? And vacations are something that interrupt work. But in France, it's completely reversed. The workers, if you recall, the major telephone company, they, the corporate headquarters decide to move workers into a new building with different offices. And the workers, some of them were so 
uh, triggered by this that they committed suicide. And, you know, look this up. It's it's amazing. It's uh, like almost two dozen suicides. Right. Based on just having to move offices, essentially, uh, because they consider the work is much, much different. So if, in fact, the U.S., as some characterize it, is yearning to go down a path of more socialism. OK, let's look at a country like France that has a very strong socialist and communist uh, component and see how that plays out. And for some, um, France is a, a good a model to live by in, in European socialism. Well, on the, I, I see what you're saying, and I've been there and I lived in France, and I understand that they genuinely are socialist. But I don't see most of these social justice warriors as socialists. I see them as fake traumatized people. They feel like they are the son of God who is on a cross being tortured and have been so for their entire lives. And I mean, even looking at the whole Black Lives Matter protest, they're mostly, when you look at them, for the most part, it is white people who take over these things, these upper middle class white people. And, you know, they act genuinely like they like they seem genuinely traumatized they seem traumatized by the images they create in their own head and i'm not sure if they're projecting like i i, I feel like there is a shift in globalization in power because of online because of a more meritocratic sort of system and i i feel like you know, the the privilege that they keep talking about, this white privilege that they act, that they assault other people with who are just minding their business, that they're projecting their own, like, insecurities, that all they, ha they do, they did have white privilege, but that's gone, and it's disappearing, and they're, they're actually traumatized by it, but they're, they're, like, inflicting it, just like an abuser, a child abuser, onto other people. So... I feel like it's like some weird psychological um, meltdown happening on mass. And you see that over and over when these people keep on showing up, a whole bunch of white kids show up at a restaurant and there are other white people eating there and they start like screaming at them at the top of their heads. And you're like, what is going on here? This like, looks like some domestic trauma, right? That <laughs> there's something going on that has nothing to do about who they're articulating the words don't match up with, you know, them. It's really about them. Right. No, I agree. It's confusing uh, to, to understand what all of the social justice movements are about. And because um, there's a lot of overlap and there's a lot of uh, mismatch and a lot of confusing language. And it's, it is difficult to figure out exactly what it is in the context of this Twitter versus um, Coinbase Silicon Valley debate. Um, so it comes down to whether or not the company has the imperative to seek profits, um, really at the exclusion of any of what are perceived to be the rights of their employees. You know, this was played out on the National uh, Football League uh, mm. when Colin Kopernak decided to take a knee. Right. So he's working for a private enterprise, the, the Football League, National Football League, the NFL and put politics into uh, that situation. Also, there was a, a, a comment by LeBron James in terms of the censorship going on in China. Mm -hmm. and, and so, again, they took activism and they put it into a private corporation's, um, you know, uh, the arena, literally. And um, so we, we, what happened there was the interest of the corporation, I think, pretty much won out uh, because the corporation in America is sacrosanct and it has ultimately the ultimate say. So here, but now it's, you have the same situation in these two Silicon Valley companies where employees are saying we have the right to express our political activism in the workplace, but that's a, that's, that's not in the contract, right? This is not a, um, it, it, this is a commercial enterprise where people are signing on, they're signing a contract and to do a certain duty and they can get fired with cause because they violated the contract, which means they would lose any benefits that they might have. And um, then the question is, are these people willing to become a martyr for their political activism? And, and many are. And, and um, they're, they're, we're at an inflection point politically in America where 
some there seems to be a lot going on and a lot changing and maybe the corporation as a unit of organization won't last either uh, so maybe they maybe that's what we're being told but at the moment th there's no this dick costello argument does not um is not consistent with the um 200 years or so of uh, of, of corporate development in the united states well corporations you know are uh, human beings now. They used to be just entities with a limited right to exist, and now they are like human beings. So we treat them like human beings, and we have relationships, and we feel that they should uh, abide by our traumas and, and assuage us and comfort us and, and you know, nuzzle us. Well, that should be his uh, attack. It yeah. should be that there was recently a Supreme Court ruling that allowed corporations to have the rights of people. Yeah. So he should say that your corporation is, in fact, um, a living, breathing personhood and er yeah. therefore i have extra extra rights yeah but what i want to say is that like it's beyond the corporation the corporation is just uh, a another figment of our imagination as humans it's something we create it's a piece of paper that says what they're going to do and that's the business they're selling beer they're selling software they're selling this and that's what they do it's just a piece of paper that humans created it's not something that exists in nature we we organize this so in the beginning, there's also the end. So that's something that we saw in Mexico City when you see the art there that is very, um, it's mixed with the Aztec, Mayan, uh, you know, indigenous people art and this, the notion of as we're coming up to the Day of the Dead, that, you know, this notion that, um, you know, this piece of art that we saw there in, at the Central Bank, actually, of Mexico is there was this baby, a little photo of a baby, painting of a baby, and it says, welcome to the world, little baby. You'll soon be dead. And that's like, so when you're saying in the beginning, you're assuming there's a middle and an end, right? So this, what we're seeing now, America in the beginning was a revolutionary enlightenment act, and we were created on enlightenment natural laws at the foundation of the United States. It was the constitution. It was the text of the constitution that we, the people in order to form a more perfect union, like we came together and wrote this. And that is what is now ending. That's the disintegration. We've, we, we're at the end of what began as an age of reason. Right. And during that time was this concept of the social contract. Right. That is how do the governors govern the governees? Right. How, what's the relationship between those being governed and those who are doing the governing? What is the relationship there? The social contract. Mm -hmm. So the Constitution of the United States lays out uh, the rights of people in the society and the limitations of power for those in power. The corporation mirrors that organization to some degree and that the corporation is there for the benefit of all those in the corporation who are striving for a profit. And it lays out what the limitations of the CEO is versus the rights of the employees to some degree. So it has a certain consistency there. So here we have um, this challenge to that agreement between everyone in the company and an individual within that structure who feels like they have needs and rights above and beyond that as expressed by the contract between the organization as a whole. That would seem to be a non-working um, initiative. Right. And the, the other point I was making was that what we're seeing is this profound insecurity tied with profound emotional um, meltdown. So, uh, you know, if you look at the Inquisition, if you look at the Salem witch trials, these are, um, these are not people who are confident in themselves, confident in their authority, confident in their worldview and their position. And they start to, um, you know, uh, basically try to stop anybody else from freely thinking otherwise. Mm. So um, we saw earlier this uh, week on MSNBC, they had one of their FBI uh, journalists on, and he was, um, he was suggesting, for example, that we need to have bipartisan presidential commissions to vet presidential candidates to make sure that there's nothing that they could be beholden to foreign powers. And what he said was that like a lot of debt, having a lot of debt means that you might be beholden, like you are subject to bribery. And 
That's one thing, but our entire fabric of our 50-year experiment in fiat dark ages is all debt. Like, can you name very, very few millennials or Generation Z are able to escape their 20s without massive amounts of student debt, housing debt, medical debt? Like, so they're all vulnerable, right? That means they're all vulnerable to blackmail and therefore, and, and to bribery. So, you know, they, but what they're saying is they don't want the people, they want to be, they, they want, you know how in uh, Iran, the Ayatollah, they, they do have elections. They have fair and free elections, essentially, except for you're only allowed to vote for the candidates that the Ayatollah says is okay to uh, run because <laughs> the, you know, they'll implement whatever the Ayatollah wants. So here they want to say, like, we're the elders. We know better. Just like the the you know the church knew better than everybody else back before the French Revolution and the Enlightenment that you know that you yourself should not seek any sort of um, understanding or trying to understand the world on your own that you should only look to Rachel Maddow you should only look to these FBI journalists on the MSNBC so you know we we're seeing that and we're going to look at some headlines about that. Right. Well, so the Renaissance is happening at a time when the old legacy system is not completely gone. I mean, it's just reaching the end game and it's crumbling and it's falling apart. And you can see it ossifying and catastrophe unfolding. But, it, 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 you know, it's not over. I mean, it's going to last for another 10 or 20 years or so. And um, so a suggestion like we need to vet presidential candidates like that, it is like a nod to the Ayatollah in, in a big way. And obviously, that's the r- absolute wrong direction if you're if you're pursuing something greater. If you had confidence in your own authority, if you had confidence in your own vision and ideology and how you rule, you wouldn't need like uh, that's why the likes of Thomas Jefferson were and were calling for a revolution every twenty years. Like that, we're confident that our constitution and what we're living by is right, and we're right, and this is good. So we're not afraid of the people. And he mentioned that he, how much he hate or George Washington, how much they hate journalists and, and newspapers, but they would d- rather die than have them not be there. So we're getting to the, the other side of that. These people no longer have faith in that. Like, so the Rachel Maddows of the world don't want people to be able to freely find information on there. They don't want a free press. They don't want, if, if the, now that, all of America is basically the free press that you can publish your opinion on so many different outlets. It's not just some billionaires or very wealthy people who own like the Washington Post or the New York Times, those two billionaire families. And like, you have to get them to like you and then publish your stuff. Now you can publish it on Twitter or Facebook or any blog or blog, you know, Substack or whatever it's called. And you know, you have a, you have a voice and that's what they're resisting. And I was, I, I, there was a tweet this week from uh, Nika Dubrovsky, who is uh, David Graeber's widow. And she grew up in the Soviet Union. And she recently commented, she posted this photo. That's a real photo. You see this woman in a suit, Stalin in the background, a, p- a painting of Stalin, and this committee. So what that is, she said, reflecting on my cultural background, this is a committee in charge of deciding which clothes could be sold to Soviet women. This was taken in Moscow in 1947 by Robert Kappa. So I said in response to that, now we have think tank driven committees determining which news is fit to go viral on social media. Yeah. Yeah. It is very Soviet like, and it is the end of a major epoch. Yes. Of, of the American experiment, as we know, it is coming to an end, just like the Soviet Union did. And I think, you know, part of the problem is that people just have a very uh, odd expectation of what governments do and what they ha- what they're there to do and what they can do. And we're at a point in the, in the U.S. where government only sees government as a cow to milk. And you've got multiple different entities trying to milk the cow harder. Rachel Maddow believes that she should get more of the milk. And this person who is criticizing Coinbase thinks he should get more of the milk. Coinbase wants more of the milk. Twitter wants more of the milk. But government should be in the completely different stage and offer something else, which is that everybody is free to pursue their own meritocratic pursuits and to compete on a fair playing field. That's what 
the U.S. government can do. And there is no free milk. There is some basic services provided like roads and post office and military and some police and whatnot. And I'm happy to fork over maybe five or six percent of my income to supply that. But beyond that, government is not is not a big cow with two, 300 million Americans, you know, trying to get more free milk. That's you know, but, it doesn't work. But, uh, you know, the, the, it's a, even bigger than that, because what we are in is a revolutionary, uh, uh, the end of a revolution. The revolution was these dark ages. The revolution was the fiat experiment. That was revolutionary. Look at 5,000, 10,000 years of human history. Nothing like that had ever happened where it was totally fictional. And a class of people could emerge, mostly American, who could just print money and own the world. They could live in palaces. They could fly around in private jets just based simply on printing some pieces. Not even They didn't even have to go so far as to do so much hard work as to print paper. It was just on a, a digital ledger, right? They could just invent this wealth that they were somehow lords of our universe. And we accepted it. A lot was like driven by Instagram and things like that. We we're like, yes, I don't know who you are, but I see you all the time and therefore have everything. And so we're at... Like, just like the Soviets, just like Stalin and Trotsky and all these people, they started killing each other. The French Revolution, they started killing each other. The reign of terror. What happened? It's like some were not, uh, you know, just loyal to the revolution. And that's what we're seeing as the fiat dark ages ends is like the disintegration of the legitimacy of that fiat system. And some people like the, those who were like, you know, empowered by this system, all those cable news stars. They were empowered by the system. A lot of the blue check on Twitter, what I'm going to read now, is I'm showing you that they, they, they cannot abide by all the deplorables. The, the, those who, um, you know, because in their world, they just get this free money and they're super wealthy and they can't understand these stinky, gross, disgusting humans outside of their circle and, and what they want. And so... One observation I've made is when I go to Twitter and, I, and now that I'm back on Facebook, Facebook seems very uh, clear to me, okay? I could see my left-wing side of my family, they're super Democrat, and I see my right-wing, super Republican side of the family. And one thing I notice is that none of the ones that are Republican are on Twitter. And all of the ones that are Democrat are on Facebook and Twitter. And the, t on Twitter, they go there to uh, be superior to everybody else with their superior uh, enlightened opinions, they believe. And it's all political. On Facebook, they never, ever, ever, like all it is is photos of their house, their travel, their children, things like that. Their lifestyle. They're promoting their lifestyle. They use it kind of like what Instagram has now become. But they're on Facebook. So... Um, so what I'm saying is tw Facebook is used by the Republicans as their way to congregate in a kind of safe space because having Republican right wing sort of conservative opinions in America is no longer dominant. The Democrats culturally are supreme and you only Democrats and Democratic opinion, corporate Democratic opinion is accepted on Twitter. And you can see that by what they've noticed when we had these crazy debates earlier this week. This is their hysteria. This is how these sort of witch hunts start. The top 10 posts on Facebook in the last two hours by pages, links only are from Donald Trump, number one, Donald J. Trump, number two, USA Patriots for Donald Trump, three, BuzzFeed, four, five, Breitbart, six, Teen Trump, seven, Donald J. Trump, eight, Antenna TV, nine, NPR, and 10, The Babylon Bee. So what are all these right-wing people? They're, they're linking to right-wing sources. This must be stopped. All the comments, like the first thing, Facebook is a dangerous zone, lies abound. Kind of gives you the impression that something might lean a bit to the right, that Facebook might be lean a bit to the right. This is why I deleted my Facebook account. And they're all like, uh, Zuckerberg must be stopped. And you're like, mm. wait, this is like in our constitution, this is like the right of the people to assemble. This is our first amendment, right? These people are assembling. And if they don't want to talk about Donald J. Trump and they like to hear his stuff on their community, like it's the same as them just walking into a little town in the middle of Iowa and saying, why are you people talking about Trump here? You must be, you know, re-educated. Right. Well, I mean, again, I just, I think people have lost perspective in terms of what what they should expect from a government. 
right? These people are essentially, they're upset because even though they've been in, made extremely wealthy with fiat money, they want to double and triple their wealth some more. So they feel this is how to make more money, right? It's not, I don't see this as politically motivated or any other than just being some greedy pigs uh, on Facebook uh, and, and all these other social media. But, you know, when you look at the GOP and, and the relation of Donald Trump and their social media presence and versus the Democrats, uh, you know, again, it's odd because although one outlet might have a perception of being uh, more GOP centric, certainly the uh, mainstream cultural zeitgeist, let's say dominated by Hollywood, would be overwhelmingly on the other side of the equation. So there is you have to look at the entire mix of media. You just can't pick out one part of it and say you're going to decide what the entire media out, you know, is based on this one subset of it. I mean, there is a huge media pie that's divided into many pieces. Yes. Yeah, but there is a de definite drive to want to silence, deplatform, and memory hole an entire part of the society. As uh, uh, I saw another figure, um, some bits of information about that um, the presidential debate, and that is the, the view numbers for all the networks. Did you see that? No. So Fox News, number one, they had 17 million viewers. On Fox News Channel, Fox, there was another Fox, and that had another 5 million. So 22 million. Um, MSNBC had about um, six or seven, maybe five and a half, six million. Uh, ABC was, bizarrely, the second most with 12 million. And then, but most, all, all other CNN had about 6 million as well. And, and yet like, so, you know, there just seems to be that it, who you have to like, you have to either reach a consensus or it just feels like what we were talking about. We started the show with this guy, Dick, who used to run <laughs> Twitter is like, there's, they, there, there's an insecurity, like they feel like really traumatized and angry and traumatized people can be some of the most violent people on earth. Right. Well, when you're comparing it to revolutions in the past and periods in the past, like the Renaissance or the revolutions of the past, and you're saying we're at a period now where we have revolution and we do have a sea change and there's a new era starting and it's the Holy ghost and it's digital and uh, it's a Renaissance. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. the flopsam and jetsam that is the social landscape is turbulent. The seas are in motion yes. and there's people stranded on little islands of idiocy that they can't get off of. They don't know how they got there because the shipwreck of their reality put them on this little island in the middle of nowhere. Then there are people on a huge cruiser with David Geffen and they're drinking champagne by the bucket load. And they're not even sure how they got there either. <laughs> Something went to an initial public offering. They've got a billion dollars. How did that happen? But they're like they're swimming around in the middle of the ocean. Then you've got people on Facebook and people on Twitter. And it's, so you're, you're standing on a collapsing ice sheet mm. as the ecology of discourse evaporates. Mm. And so it just causes people are shouting in this direction and the, the, no one's over in that direction. Then you've got, uh, you know, Joe Rogan, you know, goes over from uh, YouTube to Spotify, makes a huge deal. And then he's trying to be deplatformed. Formed. Like who would have, he would have thought they would have done a deal before Joe Rogan went over to Spotify to like he's facing the same thing that's going on between titter, titter, titter. <laughs> between Twitter. <laughs> you know, I, just on a digressive note there, I remember there used to be a magazine called Tattler and it's just full of high end Still gossip, there. high end gossip. Right. And how much of these MSNBC shows and CNN shows, it's just you know, Anderson Cooper, Rachel Maddow in the pages of Tattler, who bought what house in the Hamptons and who, you know, didn't get into what club. And they're living on the, the top deck of the Titanic and being in the estate of the rich. Uh, you know, they don't know what's going on below decks. They, they we hit the iceberg. The, it's all sinking. The UK is going under, is completely sinking. Europe is sinking. Half of the, the S&P 500 is sinking. The unemployment rate actually is skyrocketing. And, uh, you know, the dollar looks precarious at best. So the, the media, you know, so you're characterizing this as projecting insecurity, mm -hmm. which I would say is, is absolutely true. And it's also, I think, understandable because when faced with trauma and fear, 
people curl up into a fetal position and start asking for mommy because mm -hmm. they're traumatized. So that's what I'm, all of these media outlets are all screaming simultaneously for their bottle. And no bottle is coming because the fiat money era is ending. You know, you have to make your own fricking bottle with Bitcoin so that you can feed yourself. S suck your own tit, <laughs> own Bitcoin. It's not tit, you say teat, not, it's like. Suck your own teat, own Bitcoin. Right, and finally, before we throw to our guests, we're gonna go talk to Adam Curry, the pod father. And, you know, he has a lot of insight on this sort of whole deplatforming drive and he is of course also been recently on joe rogan a few times and after that presidential debacle debate well everybody was calling for joe rogan to um you know moderate the next event and of course everybody knows everybody knows he would have been better and why because sure. this is the sort of moment for heterodoxy we're only going to get the orthodox so we can throw the smack down like chris wallace yeah. had gotten up and, and and told both candidates to shut up and sit down and be, act like adults, right? And Joe Rogan could have done that. They, he could, or you could have had like a like me, like a female going up there, like a femen. You know that that group that always goes topless to get attention. Oh, they would have shut them up quick. <laughs> they would have been like. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh my God! I, I I got nothing to say to that. But speaking of that, before we throw to Adam Curry, I want to say, you know, with this whole trend of like these Karens, it's a cultural Karens. They want you to be like them, and if you're not like them, then you're causing them trauma. The fact that you have different opinions, the fact that you like chocolate ice cream and not vanilla ice cream, harms me. And this is really dangerous. And all these superior people condescending and calling everybody deplorables. Well. No, nowhere is more that than Huffington Post, right? Verizon looks to dump unprofitable Huffington Post as traffic sags because apparently people don't like to be scolded. And because they don't like to be scolded, they're going to have to go to some camps. <laughs> Remember Air America? That was a left wing yeah. uh, Rachel radio. Maddow. Metro Maddow got started. Uh, Huffington Post was a left-wing outlet. These left-wing outlets never survived. There's never been a, a good left-wing shock jock, uh, a shock of the left. It's always Rush Limbaugh, you know, those types that on the right that make those huge radio gains. There doesn't seem to be any left-wing person that, because I'll tell you why, the left-wing itself can't stand it. They, get, they hate each other. All, all the crabs in the bucket will pull any crab trying to get out of the bucket. Yeah. So when you have, let's say, I mean, I would be, for example, I've talked about this five years ago, and then I gave up. I would say I could be a shock jock of the left because I know how to just take apart all the financial scandals and sh put those people in their place. But immediately you have the crabs in the bucket start pulling at your ankles and saying, no, you can't leave the bucket. You need to be in our miserable lefty liberal bucket crying and whining all day. You can't stand up and be a hard, hard ass left winger. Uh, and, and that's, that's what that with the media history proves this. There's never, never been a hard ass left winger because the left hates it. Now I'm going to show you something, but you know, it had nothing to do with him talking about crabs. It's because I saw my reflection in there, but, uh, these, uh, pants are pretty cool. Like this is, this is just like the design of this. Uh, this suddenly has taken a strange turn. This podcast. <laughs> See, I'm trying to end this segment. I'm trying to get the speakers to shut up. This is how I would have run the presidential debate. Oh, like those women who like, are hey, out there in yeah. the desert, you know? No, 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 no. You know, you're talking about the uh, Roma that came to London, and that's what they would do. Um, to they, uh, well, my bosses uh, encountered this. They would ask you for money, and if you were like, no, no, <laughs> they would flash. <laughs> they their... would lift up their 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 skirts and show you their vaginas and start pretend masturbating. <laughs> you just throw money at them at that point. You're yeah, like, well, that's what my boss. Oh my god, did. just take it all. Just get out of here, man. Uh, here, take take it, take it all. So you know, of course, I I'm the one that got you that overall. Yes, uh, Fred Siegel uh, in uh, Fred sunset Siegel. Uh, up above the sunset marquee, but. You know, with that, like, I thought it was a great way to introduce our guest, Adam Curry. I thought he would By be, flashing. like, really excited and say, like, wow. What? I mean, he lived in the Netherlands for a long time, right? Like, have you ever walked around the Netherlands? And, like, what is that, a barcode on your vag? <laughs> That's weird. It's, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a QR code for my Bitcoin wallet. <laughs> so well, it's safe because, you know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't, I don't want to say anything other and this is the whole me too era. I'm on thin ice. And the next word I say could deplatform me from planet earth. I'm just going to shut up. Okay. Let's go to our guest, Adam Curry.
Yeah. Max, you need your glasses for this. You're cool. Yeah, I need, I need to uh, put on my cool shades, you know, so I can de- ah, stare deeply. Now we're orange pilling. That's, that oh, voice yeah. sounds familiar. That? You know, I, I've come, I'm back in the 80s suddenly. What happened? We went through a <laughs> hey, time everybody, warp. Check out this great white snake video. Oh, my yeah. God. Is that Bananarama? <laughs> YMTV. Oh, my. Hey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You've got Bananarama the hair, was cool when they were with Fun Boy 3. They were cool back then. Oh, yeah. yeah absolutely. Uh, so, I would have to agree with you on that. <laughs> so this uh, is a very messy introduction here. We're, we're about I'm to sorry. talk to yeah. our orange-pilled friend, Adam Curry. He is the pod father. Many know him as one of the you know, pioneers in the whole podcasting space. And you can find him at the No Agenda podcast every week. And you know what? You could also go check him out on Joe Rogan because he's a cool enough podcaster to have been on Joe Rogan twice. Well, he's like the mayor of Austin uh, now. You know, Adam Curry, yes, he, he was yes, not only the true. podfather and blazing a trail, not only one of the original MTV blazing a trail, but now he blazed a trail into Austin, you know, uh, and now everyone's following him. Wherever this guy goes, the market follows. Yes. And of course, Joe Rogan is also in Austin. Half of the Bitcoin world is in Austin. So, yeah, there's a lot. Yeah. So, Max and I have to go down there, bring a whole bunch of orange pills to dose you up and, uh, <laughs> you know, join a, one of our barbecues, you know, an all meat mm. barbecue at one of these uh, pod at, at the Bitcoin side of things. But, you know, you were recently, as I said, you know, you were on Joe Rogan's show for the second time. And, you know, we saw something quite interesting in this past week, I guess, when this uh, debacle of the presidential debates was held, the first of them. And almost universally, like people from all sides of the spectrum were on Twitter afterwards saying this is a debacle and Joe Rogan should do the next, uh, should host the next uh, presidential right. debate. Wh- what do you feel about this, this whole, because you were kind of at that sort of forefront way back in the MTV days when it was like more amateur compared to the ABC, NBC and CBS news at the time. Right. And you guys right. started doing more news and, and being more culturally relevant. So is that, is this one of these sort of jump to the uh, mainstream sort of moments? Well, it, I think it's, it kind of goes both ways. In, you know, when Obama came in in 2008 it was right around the, the time Twitter started. And we really, we, the internet community, certainly thought, oh, my God, this is going to be the internet president. And, you know, he actually kind of failed even at getting a website up for a billion dollars. But he never really grasped the idea. You know, the the Twitter account for POTUS was, you know, basically, you know, little uh, little statements that were put through the, the White House press office. Trump came in and he completely understood how to use the medium. And that changed everything. And that immediately also made the, the debate format invalid. It's not a modern format for today's world because everyone's so used to a linear yelling match. <laughs> you know, it's like you get a paragraph and a paragraph and a paragraph. And, and also, I, I, I kind of don't understand if you have an open discussion, why you continuously need to interrupt someone as the moderator and say, this is an open discussion. Be quiet. He's talking. But something was off there in general. Um, but yeah, it's just we have launched into a, and I, I will give President Trump credit for that. He has launched us into this new era where the old, the elite messaging system, which was basically, you know, go on the Sunday shows, do ABC, you know, maybe a 2020, do it, uh, New York Times, Washington Post, and the message is out there and I don't have to worry about it. And now that message is immediately challenged. Uh, there's multiple uh, opposing opinions. And just to make it even funnier, now the elite messaging system is uh, uh, flowing over into Silicon Valley. So everything that is a little bit too much out there is suppressed, is demonetized, is pushed down. And uh, the messaging continues. You know, They're trying to make that into their modern messaging system. What we're seeing, and this is, of course, part of the Bitcoin story, is people do grasp alternatives and these alternatives take a long time to propagate for people to understand them. They're often, uh, very counterintuitive. So, uh, digital money, as I've really made quite a study of, uh, of crypto, uh, you have to think differently about money I and mean, you don't pay someone, they send you an invoice. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So there's all these little, little things that, uh, make you think differently. And to me, it's like, 
I think differently no matter what. So I look at stuff and go, oh man, we could maybe use this that way. Or uh, so it's super exciting. Uh, but there's a lot of catch up that has to be played by the traditional infrastructure. Right, right. So that wall of uh, software disruption that hit every industry in the world over the past 30 years finally caught up to money in 2009. And so it's uh, having this revolutionary impact and it does uh, challenge the legacy system and that is uh, not not easy for a lot of people to handle and I know even your comment on Rogan about Bitcoin uh, you got you were challenged by the Bitcoin community uh, so the Bitcoin community itself is not coherent in its message either no and and here's the interesting part is um, so I said a couple things on Rogan and the first thing is well I've learned some things. I have a big mouth, so I jump into things feet first and say, "Wow, you know, this is what I think about something." And um, there's some, there's something about society in general. It doesn't matter what the topic is. The people who advocate for something, once someone else goes, "Oh, okay, thanks, I kind of get it," and I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna tell somebody, then they pop up and say, "Yeah, ho, 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 hold on, you, you don't represent us. You don't know shit. You don't know that guy. You you can't." So this hubris comes in, and it's not just the Bitcoin community, but that's a great example. Um, it's it's in all kinds of uh, uh, in all different scenarios where people um, are advocating for something and someone comes along and you're not part of the group. You're not you're not doing it right, basically. Right. The Karen the phenomenon, other, the Karen's a little bit. Yeah. But but I think that's a societal. It's not just a Karen thing, um, because I saw it also with ADOS. So that's, that's a I've been studying a lot about American descendants of slavery versus uh, saying someone's African-American or black. And then there's, I've learned about Hotep. There's all different versions of it. And when I mentioned that on Joe Rogan, I got the exact same response that I did from the Bitcoin community. Who are you? Who are you to talk about that? I don't know. I'm just a guy who's trying to move, move the discussion forward. You know, I don't get too much. But the funniest thing is on our show, we have uh, a jingle by uh, a guy in New York, Reverend Manning, and he's kind of an outrageous preacher. And he has this great bit where he talks about the apocalypse is coming and you're going to need a Bitcoin. And so it's literally this. They're saying that all hell is going to break loose and you're going to need a Bitcoin. So I said that and uh, people lost their shit. <laughs> what about altcoins? <laughs> you know, what about Ethereum? Come on, man. Ripple's going to be the new Fed coin. Like, okay, all right. Oh, slow down, everybody. Slow down. So it's kind of an offhanded joke, but I have learned over the past five years, uh, and I, I can proudly say for myself, I'm a Bitcoin maximalist. I am, I'm pretty much there in the level of uh, crypto. Well, you did mention the only person in the Bitcoin community that does matter on the Rogan show. Uh, I believe well, my well, name hello. came up. Uh, uh, you know, quite prominently. But you, you, you're yeah, gonna... I have a question because, um, you know, what you're describing there, um, this isn't my question, but I'm just going to make an observation about what you said is this happens with every celebrity. They mention Bitcoin and they get piled on by thousands of shit coiners. And I can understand why they're confused because, you know, many Bitcoiners went through that whole process when uh, these shit coins, the altcoins started emerging in like, well, some of them emerged in 2011 and 2012, but mostly 2014 th through 2017, you start to uh, like question and it, it, it gets confusing. So I can't imagine like somebody like Joe Rogan, I saw he also was bombarded by all the shit coiners. Mm -hmm. So it is mm -hmm. confusing. But in terms of what you were talking about, and this is something that Max and I have been talking about a lot, is the elite messaging system has failed. Um, mm -hmm. Matt Taibbi wrote a great piece uh, about that, the elite messaging yes, system Yes, he did. Failed. In fact, that's, prob that's probably where that came from in my head. It's probably from Matt's piece, yes. Yeah, yeah. And it's really good. And I think that we see this all around us in the social media space especially. And especially from the left, like the MSNBC, the so-called left, the MSNBC mm -hmm. and CNNs of the world. So how do you see that playing out on social media? Because, you know, theoretically, anybody could start a podcast or a show, but really the only way to get distributed is through YouTube. And YouTube has been demonetizing loads of people and uh, hiding, basically. It's hard to even find them. So like pre-2016, 2017, Look back at MSNBC and CNN uh, posts on YouTube. They would get mm -hmm. maybe 5,000 views, 6,000 views. Mm -hmm. Now they get 100, 200, 300,000 views every time because YouTube mm -hmm. pushes them. If you're looking yep. for, you know, if you're looking for Adam Curry, you're going to get Rachel Maddow first. 
Right. Because we do have kind of that crazy lesbian look. I you understand. do. You do. You look like her. Very hot <laughs> By lesbian. By the way, just, just as a side note, your hair is really great. I love it this way. That's really nice. I noticed the way it is. The, the, today also. I'm like, wow. <laughs> yeah, this yeah. is awesome. And I've had to learn how to dye with... my own hair. I, I do oh, right. bleach and, and toner and all this stuff. Thanks to oh, YouTube. Yes. Thanks to YouTube, by the way. Yeah, it's really yep. nice. I, I did. I uh, believe it or not, it was orange first. I turned it orange <laughs> accidentally. I believe it. And then I fixed I have it. No, <laughs> no reason not to believe it. <laughs> so, what's just like uh, cryptocurrencies, just like Bitcoin. Eventually, and, you know, it takes a long time. Things change over time. So um, with No Agenda Show, we kind of migrated the entire um, listening or producing audience. We really consider them all to be producers pr pr primarily. We move them over to a Mastodon instance. So, you know, it's noagendasocial.com. And it's a social network that functions very much like Twitter, but doesn't have the algorithms. So it's kind of fun to see, you know, sometimes there's a disagreement, an argument, and it ends pretty quick. Because the, the, the algo is not pushing this in your face again. And, you know, you go and check in and you read and you scroll down a certain point. Oh, OK, I've already seen this. Well, that's it. There's no more messages. You know, it's a it's a it's a it's a reverse chronological order. And that's what you get. And there are millions of people on these Mastodon instances, which which federate. So I'm a strong believer in decentralization. Uh, I think for Twitter, literally the future will have to be federation they have to you know they can provide the experience and the algorithms but it has to work across all these disparate systems kind of like email which you know is still pretty distributed and open system um and it's education i mean kids kids in the west and also it's even worse in uh, in africa or, or other nations poorer nations where you get a facebook phone and you know you don't have a browser yeah but it defaults to facebook and that's your internet that's your introduction I think every parent should grab an old laptop that they have laying around with a Linux install CD, toss it to their kid and say, get it running, get a web server up and uh, let me know if you have a problem, but really try and figure it out online because they'll benefit so much from, from understanding what you can do. It's, it, the power is in our hands. No one has to use these networks. We do because um, it's convenient, we're lazy, we don't understand, we're not interested and above all, um, we want to be celebrities. You know, it's uh, it's narcissism. Mm -hmm. It's fucking narcissism. Right. What you're describing there is kind I, of... I, uh, I, I need to stop swearing. I'm sorry. No, that's quite all right here. That's <laughs> fine. We'll just edit that out. Uh, yes. To, to apply some heavy-handed censorship in post. <laughs> yes, that's fine. We and fix it in post, as always. It's always. We'll fix that in post, right? Right, right, quick. So, yeah, what you're describing there is kind of like, a, you know, you're almost branded in the womb. You know, you come out of the out of the womb, really living and breathing Facebook or some other brand, and yeah. you have a branded life. And uh, you, you never experience life outside of a brand. And that seems dystopian in a lot of ways. But, you know, I wanted to ask you, so, uh, you know, you helped pioneer the podcasting space, if not outright invented it, that, that whole concept. And you've seen now a podcaster, Joe Rogan, you know, he's become allegedly the $100 million man, right? So that's incredible. But now you've got a new tool offering some censorship resistance to the podcast space. Tell us about this new thing you got going. Okay, so a little background on podcasting. Um, once it was developed, and for me, that was just looking at uh, a device and seeing something different. So I didn't see the iPod as a, a jukebox or you know some di digital music collection. I saw it as a radio receiver. So that, you know, that is what became podcasting. And uh, once the protocol was developed and out there, I focused much more on the production and content creation side and, and building content. Uh, and because that's all that was all that's why it came to me is because I'm a broadcast. That's what I want to do. Um, so Steve Jobs invited me to come visit him. Um, and I, we met for about an hour. And he basically was doing a very nice thing. He was asking me for my blessing. Could I put it into iTunes? This is before the, the iPhone. And I said, yes, and let me give you the index that we've built so far of all the podcasts you can get started. Because to me, um, that side is the radio side. I've never had to think about building radios in my entire career. There's always some, someone making radios, it's around. Um, but Apple became the default and they've been fantastic stewards of podcasts. They've been really good. And they allow anyone who wants to have a podcast app, i.e. a modern radio, um, anyone who wants that to get the information from their database. 
uh, two things happened. Uh, one, Alex Jones was deplatformed from the Apple database. So when it was removed there, that had a domino effect and a whole bunch of other uh, radio receivers no longer could receive Alex Jones because they were coming off that central source. Um, and you know, who knows what they don't allow in on the intake. So there's all, it's a, it's a, it's a bottleneck. It's a bottleneck where there's commercial interests that have nothing to do with the programming, but everything to do with who is running that. And that's Apple. And then Joe got the Spotify deal. Now, first of all, I'm delighted for him. I could not be happier. Uh, I've gained a friend. We we just become friends before the deal. So I got lucky on the upside and I, you know, convinced him to move to Austin. You know, we're going to, you know, kick the mayor out. I'm going to do all kinds of radical shit here in Austin. So I'm very excited about having him. <laughs> we got to do something. Um, but what that means is Joe will disappear from all the other radios when he's exclusive on Spotify. So that's a vacuum. We need to have a place where the next five Joe Rogans can come from. And But I'd also like a place where a professor can put up his lectures easily. It doesn't have to go through a bottleneck. And it can be available that same day on the apps, the radios, everywhere. And we have two problems. There's no uh, incentive for people to build podcast apps uh, because they're very difficult. You know, maintaining a database of all the shows, you have, it's, a, it's a deep morass of stuff. A lot of stuff was never fixed because it kind of stayed at Apple and there was never any innovation. So there's no incentive. They're also not cut into the, the value chain. You know, go, if, if it's uh, advertising or if it's uh, donations, that goes from the audience to the producer, the podcaster, and the guy in the middle making the radio can sell his app for 99 cents. You know, it just has no incentive. So the first thing we needed to do is create uh, what I call preserve uh, podcasting as a platform for free speech. And that means we have a, a database, which right now is centralized, but it is a community resource with, because all these different hosts, everyone who uh, um, offers podcasting services, they can now add their new feeds into our database automatically. It will be distributed maybe on IPFS, the interplanetary file system. So it can never really go away. It'll be immutable. But there's a lot of things we need to fix, like people stealing feeds and scamming them and, and having many duplicates to game searches, et cetera. So um, I set this up with uh, Dave Jones, my, um, my partner in, in this. And that is mission number one, is uh, preserve it as a platform for free speech. And we have a community of about 100 developers who jumped in right away. Uh, they're fixing these database issues, fixing categories. How, you know, uh, finding bogus feeds, people coming in with AI and machine learning to do this. So that's fantastic. And the next part will be retool podcasting as a platform of value. And that is where uh, cryptocurrency comes in. And, and I've been, since we started this project, a lot of people have been basically pitching us like we can do it this way and that way. And, and it's very exciting because um, when you have uh, the resource, the centralized resource under control of the community instead of Apple, you know, or someone else, well, now we can start to build something. Now we can figure out what works and what doesn't work. And everyone has to be in that value chain. And from what I've seen, man, there's just, there's a lot of people who make wallets who got nothing to sell. <laughs> so uh, I can see wallets become podcast uh, apps. Why not? You know, now we finally have some ideas cooking. You know, that's how I look at the situation. Right. So, you know, you're looking at this Bitcoin, you know, which is a technology stack, right? There's many layers to it. And you can take that stack apart and reassemble it and be very creative with it. Uh, like we saw in the dot-com era, people took the basic protocol and they created lots of different applications and mm -hmm. it, it developed over time. And same thing with this basic Bitcoin stack. When people get confused and they think that, oh, I've rearranged the Bitcoin stack, therefore it's going to compete with Bitcoin as money. No, that's never going to happen. But in terms of what you're saying is, oh, I can wallet as podcast. Why not? That, that's great. Uh great ideas and great innovation. And this is what the space needs. They need people from media, broadcasting, creative folks to come in and, and play, play around. And there needs to be that without the, without being, you know, chastised and yelled at, uh, you know, it's not, it's not great in that way. So um, I think our friend has a question, a follow up. Yeah. Well, I have a, I, I, uh, am I your friend? No, hey, you can, are can channeling I, can I just my friend. Can I just respond to that for one yeah, second? Yeah. Um, so just so you know, I'm not hurt. I'm 56. I mean, it, it makes me smile. I learned something about myself and my big mouth, and I need to nuance some things. But I'm, 
I'm definitely not hurt. If anything, I'm like, wow, there's a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of uh, energy here that needs to be unleashed. I'm okay with, with, with people yelling at me for that. I don't think anyone's really super angry. But yeah, you're right. It, do, it does thwart people from coming in. But it's societal. I think we'll get beyond it. It's been 10 years now. You know, 15, it, one of the, it may one be of the very things different. about Bitcoin is that it actually has no brand because it's not centralized, yes. right? There's no well, I like how you. It's kind of the, like, for me, I see it as like the TCP IP right. of the early days of the internet. That's what it is. So, you know, what, what can we do with this? We can make an HTTP protocol for web browsers, a FTP for file transfer, SMTP for email, and this can all be a part of it. So I'd like the stack analogy. I'm personally, I like side chain and off chain stuff. It's like, oh, this is also fun what's happening here. So yeah. there's a lot of stuff that's interesting, really interesting to look at. Right. And every time there's been an attempt to create a Bitcoin foundation or Bitcoin group that is like at the center, it always blows up within three or four months because Bitcoin oh, yeah. hates centralization. And anyone yeah. that tries to get into it in a in centralized way just gets atomized immediately. Right. And we have a question from Madge Weinstein about this. Oh, Madge. Yeah, yeah. Madge creates some content for Orange Pill Podcast, and oh, she, nice. she's always a huge hit with the show, um, with the audience. And she wants to know, my question for Curry is, how will he cash in on this directory without compromising its open nature? Nothing wrong with making money. I just want assurance that the directory will always be open. She's having problems yes. right now with... Um, Apple podcast. Yeah, with Google. With Go I think Google oh, oh, or Google. Apple, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, Google. So I've, I've known Madge a long time, uh, started on my network as the, the original bloated lesbian and uh, love Madge. Madge actually is uh, working with us at, at uh, podcastindex.org uh, and, uh, you know, or at least is looking along and, and that we welcome all of that. So again, there's two pieces to this. One is the index. This is a community resource and our promise is that this has to be always it's i mean already we make an archive and that's on archive.org so anyone can pick that up and and go off and run with it you know so th that's the whole point in fact we'd like people to duplicate our work so we have less uh you know less of a po single point of failure and again that's why we see some hash space where we can put that up and you know so now we're just looking at functionality the second part retooling as a platform of value i hope to make money there just like everyone else um, that would mean that whatever we put in place, this value chain has to function for all the players. And it's the, uh, in my mind, it's the audience, it's the producer, it's the app developer. It should also maybe be the hosting provider. So, you know, there, and, you know, even people who run stats, et cetera, they, they should be able to at least participate this in this, in a free market. And, um, a free market is regulated, you know, that you come up with pricing. So it's all going to come down to pricing. And uh, I want to be in the pricing mix. And, you know, I'd, lo I'd love to. I think it's appropriate if, we're, if we're, we can set this up and running it. But that can only be, you know, a, a fair and equal percentage to all the other players, except for the producer. I think the producer of the podcast, that's a product. That's the main product. And quite honestly, if I can make it work, and I can make value flow through through podcasting, but really flow like money. You know, I see MP3 bits going this way, and I see money bits going that way. Whatever it is, it's just it's just computer bits. Um, as a podcast producer, I hope to benefit from that enormously and secure my own future because it's not just uh, Silicon Valley companies that are in media that are uh, threatened by this, but payment systems. Uh, and we're seeing, you know, it, so today it's the guy who has CBD. Uh, which is a problem for some payment systems. Uh, tomorrow, you know, it's, it's just, you know, well, it's already so many different ones, you know, um, uh, small coffee shops, uh, of course, sex workers is, you know, that's a, a problem. Um, all of this. So what's to say the lowest rung on the showbiz ladder, the podcaster isn't next. You know, you can't just say, oh, it's only happening over there. It's bound to happen. So uh, I like the idea of having alternatives and it's manageable. There's 1.8 million podcast feeds, four or 500,000 are actually really active, uh, very manageable um, uh, versus in, like a YouTube. You know, that's, I, I, you need billions of dollars to do that and you, and you can't be profitable. I'm sure YouTube is writing off that expense for all the other uh, profit 
parts of the business. Right. So that that's going to require some upfront cost, right? So you guys just on a business, put my business hat on for a second. Uh, is that yeah. something you can go out and get partners and you're going to manage no, a team? No, or how are you going to no, no. That? No, I mean, I've been the VC route. I've done Kleiner Perkins, Sequoia. I've done, been, had, I took a company public. This is not necessary. Uh, I understand fundraising v really well with no agenda. We use the value for value uh, uh, concept where what, what, whatever this show was worth to you, give that back to us in time, talent, or treasure. So we get a lot of people who analyze or specialists. They give us their time, their talent. Uh, we have people developing things for us. Their treasure is, of course, people who gladly uh, uh, give us money. And the question is, well, I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to devalue my product in a store that says it's 99 cents, like a number one hit song that uh, the Beatles put their, their entire heart and soul into. I find that insulting. You tell me what it's worth to you. Is an hour worth one buck? Fine. For some people, $3 a lot of money. Someone else will say, here's 300. That's the, that's the value to them. That's, that's your own proposition. And that seems to work really well. So when we started, we have a podcast, uh, Podcasting 2.0, um, which uh, my partner Dave and I, we talk about the developments. It's just the, we're doing the same thing as, as how podcasting started uh, 15, 16 years ago. And we just say, what's it worth to you, this work? So we have enough to cover our basic server costs for at least four or five months. Um, and uh, people set up recurring donations. For some, it's 10 bucks. For some, it's 100 bucks a month. Um, and if people stop supporting it, I'm sure we could run it out of our own pockets for a while. But so far, we have no problems. You know, it's, uh, it's kind of funding. And again, this is something I have to do. And if there's uh, money in it, that'll flow down to me. I mean, podcasting, there was no patents, no copyrights. There's no billion dollar check for Adam Curry. Uh, but I benefited. Your, your voice it, cracked when you said that. Yeah, you got all <laughs> panic stricken. No million. Your, your no, face got I, flushed, I, and I noticed everything. The, sorry, a small fire erupted well, in the background funny. there. It, What's going it's, on? It's funny, but um, so the the news of podcast index launched, and the Dutch newspaper printed. Adam Curry launched something, and in ten years we'll know what the what he was really talking about. <laughs> and so that's kind of the way things have gone for me. Uh, but I'm very happy because, you know, everyone gets uh, exactly what they deserve. And uh, and this is just another piece of, uh, you know, I, I cannot write my book until I do this, whether it works or not. So if I feel like this is a good one to do, I'm very excited about it. So I want to ask you, you know, you do your weekly podcast, you have to cover the news. There's lots of little clips. I owe I always listen when, when you talk about us, when you play a clip of us. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, hello. Of course you do. Of course. <laughs> but, you know, I, so you're in, you know, like you observe the world around you and the, especially geopolitics. A lot of the U.S. is all about, um, you know, very hyper-partisan sort of small stories. So mm -hmm. I want to ask you about this whole process we're seeing right now of deglobalization, because you're also seeing de a, a, a sort of fragmentation of the Internet uh, hard that's coming sure. down. And even mm -hmm. like this, this, this action by the Trump administration to seize TikTok technology. I mean, this is, um, you know, where do you see this going in terms of the internet space? Because will, will we have a, a world where like Facebook not only domestically has a Facebook Republican and a Facebook Democrat, but they also have a Facebook U S a Facebook China, a Facebook, like, so there's no interaction allowed as, it seems there's a lot of insecurity at the top. They don't like uh, all those uh, people down there hearing foreign ideas. Where do you see this going? Uh, I don't know if you've seen the social dilemma. It's a it's a pretty good a pretty good uh, documentary on Netflix, um, and I agree with most points in it. Uh, a lot of it kind of goes towards other agendas of the people who made it. But in general, um, the and this is no news to you. The, in, the entire purpose of social networks, but also even Google, just the way they function, uh, is to create uh, engagement. And the engagement, you know, they're just, they're just uh, scamming our brains. You know, it's like in a casino. Oh, I pull this, this happens. Ooh, that happens. Like, you know, they time how these triggers work. And um, the number one way to get engagement is to keep showing something you disagree with at regular intervals. So everyone thinks, oh, it's just an echo chamber. No, if the echo chamber becomes too good, then the algos throw in some kind of rock. And so um, parents need to understand there needs to be a fundamental deglobalization at the nuclear family level where we say, hey, hold on a second. 
also, we need to stop in general as Americans, um, although I can speak to other countries, relying on third party for our for our for our stuff. So, you know, we don't go over to the neighbor and say, hey, man, no, we call 311 and have the city come over. And, you know, we're pussies. So we're, let, we're letting social networks in between us. And what's bad about it is we don't really know exactly what they're doing. So we need to move to uh, independent systems, which are just as accessible. You know, it's just one click away. Um, it's a tough transition because you even like with Mastodon, the apps that people had in app stores to connect to them were taken away because, oh, Lordy, you could actually connect to something on the internet that had hate speech, so therefore it violated their terms of service. So I just ordered a Pine phone, Pine 64. It's a Linux phone. You know, I can put it totally under my control. Uh, we need to move to other products. Now, will that happen? Well, no. You know, just like every country gets the government she deserves, you know, we're going to shape our own lives. And people are, uh, are stupid. They need to take take a look at what they're letting their kids do, where they're letting it do it, and 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 let's learn a little bit. You know, let's change some things in schooling so we give. Let's do a little history of the internet. It's been around for enough. We can talk about the history and what you can actually do with it, and teach the kids a little bit of the underpinnings of it. Because now you're just throwing them into a branded, mind controlled system. Now, here's the good news: because of the way things are run today, it's easily to at least get some challenging word out for a little bit. So, well, yes, we're in a deglobalization period. The globalists are doing everything they can. If you see, I'm sure you've seen Build Back Better. This is the uh, Biden-Harris slogan, but it's also used by Boris Johnson. It's also used by Mark Rutte of the Netherlands, literally in English, Build Back Better, everybody. So um, it is a UN uh, initiative, Build Back Better. The World Economic Forum has a podcast called The Great Reset, where we learn to build back better. This is a globalist agenda. The media is not talking about it, but people are catching on because like, hey, did that guy steal it from that guy? Because now, now the messaging system is kind of convoluted and you, it's almost like the old DVD regions where you couldn't watch the DVD in that country until it was official. So it was never really in the intention, I don't think, um, for us to know that, this, that the United States presidency there's a candidate running with the same slogan as the uh as they are in in the uk or in the netherlands or oh and uh, the new the new guy in japan build back better it this is it's crazy so that at least is recognizable but you can no longer really uh deconstruct it uh on these platforms that are a part of it they're a part of it and it's all connected to green new deal and sustainable and equity and black lives matter the ink black lives matter ink is also a part of the system so you're, so you're saying the, you're saying there's the there, there's like two forces here there's the deglobalization people talk about but you're talking about the globalists that mm -hmm. are connected the tissue of them connected uh in such a way that they're even sharing political slogans uh, mm -hmm. Where they're at the UN or where they go to Davos. So there is during this deglobalization uh, period that there is also a counter thread of an of, of a form of globalization. I mean, I hadn't heard this sharing of I, political I slogans, but it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, you know, oh yeah, of course. Right, and so um, you know the globalist agenda is countered by. This idea that we talk a lot about, you guys talk a lot about, you know, individual sovereignty, you know, that we have our, we, we should be in possession of our own selves to, to a large degree. And this is where Bitcoin comes in and this other type of mm -hmm. thing. Um, you know, let me just uh, change gears here for, for a second. So I love this phrase. I just heard it a couple of weeks ago. Get woke, go broke. <laughs> right. Yeah. And now we've seen well, this. This is being played out in Silicon Valley right now with, between Coinbase, which is a, quote, crypto company, and mm -hmm. uh, Twitter. So Brian Armstrong at Coinbase put out a memo, and he said that we no politics at work. If you want to bring your social agenda to work, I'll buy out your contract. But if you stay, we're going to be focused on the mission of Coinbase, which is precludes the social justice initiative, any of those things. Uh, and that got a lot of attention. And then Jack Dorsey at Twitter 
made it known that he totally disagrees with this stance and that people should be able to bring in their social agenda to work. So this, but, but underlying it is this get woke, go broke thing. You know, Coinbase is saying like, we're here to make money and we're trying to go public and we're a, we're a for-profit corporation and we don't have time for anything. You know, they've got a rule over there, 996, I think, it, over at Coinbase. So you're working from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week, right? And they're like, look, we don't have time for this shit. You know, we're just making money. So uh, I guess the question is, um, were you aware of that? How do you fall? How do you view that? You know, you're a business guy. What is this true? If you get woke, you go broke. What's going on here? Of course, it also ties to Spotify and the deal with Joe Rogan because all the employees there are saying they're they're they feel threatened by some of his guests yeah. and the uh, and the yeah. Um, well, I think uh, well here what's it's blackmail. That's really it's corporate blackmail, and um, it is because of fear. Uh, obviously, and good on any CEO. I, mean, I know also some small business owners in Austin who said, no, 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 I'm just not participating in any of the wokeness. I have a business to run. And if you don't like it, you can go. And it turns out when you stand up to it, it's like, it, it dissipates pretty quickly. Public companies is different, difficult. And, then, you know, and so I think it's, it's interesting, you know, when they, uh, I didn't know this about Coinbase, but, you know, doing an offering, they'll get some resistance. Uh, to me, uh, the best example is our professional sports, uh, where they are they went completely woke and basketball. I mean, I kind of got into basketball, you know, just before the lockdown, um, you know, just to watch it a little bit more. And then all of a sudden, you know, I'm seeing uh, United in Black, Black Lives Matter logos in some of the most expensive places, you know, here on the back, on the court, on the screens. And what's happening is the fans are rejecting it. The fans are saying no mas, and they just are not interested anymore. And um, uh, the ratings show it. I mean, the, it's it's the worst ever for all of these sports leagues. So that's a go woke, go broke example. Um, this started, and we identified this on our show about six or seven years ago in Seattle. There was a an uprising at the Noodles Company, and the, and we have this longish clip of this kid who we call the Noodle Boy Kid. Um, who's like, well, it's just not fair. We should be able to also say how the company runs. And it's just stuff that's foreign to running an organization. Um, this, again, this, again, it comes from academia. Uh, a generation now, uh, and I don't want to say millennials, but it is in, this, in a part of that age range, who have just been um, uh, educated this way. And it's very sad for them because, you know, my daughter, I, I have two stepdaughters, uh, 23 and 25, and my, uh, my daughter is 30. She's kind of on the edge of it and she sees it. And I think those kids are really going, oh, holy crap. And they're disconnecting from everything. Um, and the younger generation uh, is really entitled. Uh, they f and, and they have all kinds of hangups, fear, uh, fear of um, uh, really of upsetting somebody. I always say, and it, uh, if I look at, truly look at them, they are uh, a generation, really 10 years, of people who are underinformed and over socialized, and that has to be stopped. Right, right. Well, just hearing you talk there for a second, you know, it got me thinking that you were talking about the jersey space, right? And the these logos and messages mm -hmm. appear on the jersey and very prominent spaces spaces. So that it's it's a huge commercial consideration. But we're also saying at the same time that there is no more public domain. Every single space that of our consciousness is branded in some way. Every you look at ten thousand commercial images a day. So this fight for public access, for public for a public domain, for civil liberties is is saying they're pushing into this space because there are there is no public space there is no way to 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 express these views anymore there's no public access cable you know back in the 70s i remember public access cable that's how alex jones got started public access cable in austin texas that was the beginning of his uh, career uh, but that but, really but doesn't I, exist i have to anymore. disagree with the, the public space i mean i think we're we have to look at the terms now um I, I do not. So Joe Rogan, you know, he'll be big and he'll still be big in his limited universe. Adam Curry will always be big in my limited universe. Now, can that limited universe sustain what I'm doing? I posit that you can have a podcast, uh, no matter what it is, but if it interests 100 people, 100, and you do an hour and you say, what was it worth to you if you're really making an outstanding product? 
and that can be an opinion to something that is uh, goes along with a vocation or or science or art. Uh, those people will support you. I have proof that this works. It is absolutely you can't, and they will support you enough to keep you going. That has been proven to work. It's different than any other model we really consider a business model. But two families, the Dvoraks and the Currys, have been functioning quite fine on this. Um, and you can do these things outside of the big space. So we have kind of these tribes. So uh, your show and uh, Red Pill or Orange Pill has um, a tribe around it. Uh, now our, we have a Venn diagram. They're crossing over and the Rogan people. And this, and I see this continuously. Um, and, you, and when I've been on Rogan the first time, we had people coming over. They'd never been asked to donate money. And they're like, hey, I'm here to donate some money. I, I caught you on Joe and I like it. And, uh, and so that fits. And that's how our messaging from decentralized media tribes will start to get out. The idea that you need to be on Twitter to go viral and get 5 million views, forget about it. They won't even let you do that. Do you remember Coney 20, uh, 20, <laughs> 2012? And they had 100 million views overnight. Yeah, no, that, wa that wasn't rigged. And almost you know, every so week I l turn to Stacy and I say, nothing has been the same since Coney 2012. To me, that was, was a watershed moment, moment yes, in yes. our disassociation with ourselves, that we mm -hmm. lost the plot utterly at that moment. And it's just been going downhill since. It, but now, see, for me, that's content. It's hilarious to see the global citizen organization with their lame-ass concerts, you know, the same people who always come in and give the little celebrities. That, now, the shutdown, I think, psychologically, celebrities have no idea what's going to happen to them because people lost respect. The mystique was gone. It was cool for a little bit. But then it's like, you know what? You're actually kind of just annoying with your Instagram posts. You know, and what's your problem? You're living in that mansion. You, you see it. Ellen gets taken down. Um, everyone's getting little little pings, and you know we're no longer interested in your life. This is uh, a, a fundamental change that it's time to grasp. People are spreading out. They're going different places. So, you, I don't think you can have the instant overnight. Wow, I did CBS with Dan. Rather, everybody knows what the hell I'm talking about. But I'll do Max Kaiser. I'll do Hotep Jesus. I'll do Joe Rogan. And now all of a sudden there's something going and I have a, my own show with a message. And, you know, so that's how things start to happen. I, I, I'm very positive about the future. I just hope we, uh, we stay healthy throughout it because <laughs> we're not the youngest chickens anymore. That's all I care about. Whoa. I never you looked at it like that. A little file. Right. File and if you I'm know, following up on that, I want to say, uh, with our Kaiser report television show, we are actually dubbed into Spanish and, it is huge. Like we get up to, we get average over 200,000 views, but 700,000, a million views every single episode, three times a week. And that's a huge audience. So I'm thinking like, you've kind of inspired me that we could go find our audience. If we only need a hundred, you're saying like, we've got several hundred thousand Spanish. We can't speak <laughs> Spanish speaking people. I mean, I mean, it's, 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 it's it, here's the thing. It's very odd, but if you just ask somebody, Hey, would you send us some money to keep this going? Turns out people do that gladly. Now, there's, there was a lot more friction uh, 13 years ago when we started. And that, of course, is still, you know, in my mind, the biggest problem that we face today with our own sovereignty. And I'm running my own full node here, by the way. I feel pretty sovereign All myself. Right. Yeah, baby. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. He's thank fully you. noted. Yeah. That's the man. Fully, I'm noted up. <laughs> I'm fully noted up. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my thought because yeah, of all so the ad adulation. <laughs> well, well, what I was saying is that Max and I need to learn how to speak Spanish. Austin's probably oh, a good right. place to learn, right? Yes. Yes. Um, well, for us, it's not even a capital situation, you know, because we got in at Bitcoin starting at a dollar. So it's not like cap, it's not capital. It's just a matter of having a vision that fits reality. You know, it's like our media strategy is a bit piecemeal and we at uh, different pieces, but it's hard to come up with a coherent way to approach it because, I mean, Orange Pill Podcast, I think, is really fits a, a, a very important piece for us because it's like an umbrella brand that everything else can fit into. Right. Um, and, Plus, it's yeah. positive. Like you're saying, you're saying you have hope for the future. I, I see yes. what we see here on Orange Pill Podcast is that we're at the end of the fiat dark ages. 
that for sure. only for sure. we'll, we'll realize this, we'll recognize this the past 50 years as a dark ages when we're in the future, when we can look back on this, uh, we'll so, be able to see. So here's exactly the problem that I'm having. And I understand if we all lived in the world of uh, Bitcoin and we valued everything in Bitcoin, life would be much easier. So this transitionary period where someone, so someone hears Bitcoin right away, they're like, eh, if they, if they have no experience with it. Um, I can make a system where you can onboard someone into some, some ecosystem and just continuously show them dollars and say, here's how much you have now in dollars and it's digital. But um, what people are going to have to learn at a fundamental level sometime, somewhere, is how inflation and deflation works. And so when you have a digital wallet and you're looking at dollars, not Satoshis, and you see, hey, it was $2 more yesterday, these are, these are the onboarding problems that we have for the rest of the world uh, to understand that there's a different way, a more sovereign way, whatever you want to call okay, it. Let me ask you a question. Uh, since you lived in Amsterdam and you speak Dutch, is it? I remember, I've been in Amsterdam many times. As I recall, one of the big daily newspapers there posts a data point every day about how your purchasing power is today. Mm. It's sure. almost like an inflation index every day. And yes. they put it right on that front page. And was I dreaming that or was that? No, you... no, I, I don't know if they still do that, but oh, sure. And, and the, the Dutch were, were, I think, very, very informed. Now their media has been hijacked, oddly enough, by a Belgian company that owns all of the newspapers. <laughs> and so they're controlling the message from the South. And if the Dutch really knew it, they'd probably go nuts. Um, but that it's still that kind of education. So either we go full bore and say, OK, you're now living in the land of all these different kinds of monetary Piece, money systems that or uh, currency that has different names. And, and you know, I think people can understand, okay, if it's euros, then it'll be this much in pounds and it goes up and down. But people really only think about that when they're going on vacation. And worse, you know, the people of Europe used to know this very well. And, you know, of course, once we made them all have their own money and suffer under, uh, <laughs> under that system, um, that went away. So it's, uh, there's a there's a there's a, a learning process. I hope that um, there's this one there's one trick I have up my sleeve. Um, if I can give wallets to a half a million podcasters, I also have half a million podcasters who will explain to their audience what the heck we're doing. That's the magic bullet. That's a pretty big megaphone, and um, and it'll go both ways. I think people will say, "Hey, podcaster, there's this system you can connect to." And it would work, and I would send you money. Well, you know, you get people's attention with that. So one way or the other, these things are going to happen. Um, but I don't think there's any tr – people don't understand the loss of fiat. Uh, they don't understand, you know, this, uh, the extended uh, no-currency printing periods. People don't understand what, what the Federal Reserve is at least signaling they want to do with Fed now and the digital, you know, the digital wallet, which could possibly – bypass swift i mean i've i've read all the rumors i've seen the scan page from the office of the currency the controller of the currency and that ripple is going to be it i've heard it all um but for sure fed now is something real and when you have your money in a digital wallet and inflation and deflation can take place straight from the fed in your wallet you know 16 digits behind the decimal that's going to be super interesting They'll, yeah, no, you know, they, no, no, no doubt about it. You know, I mean, I think that's where the things are headed to is definitely direct deposit from the Fed. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this word, these words inflation, deflation are fascinating because you, you talk to 10 different economists and they'll give you 10 different definitions. Right. Yeah. Which is interesting because it's a fundamental concept that shouldn't be open to such uh, interpretation. But essentially in a deflationary world like a uh, Bitcoin world, you know, it's something akin to stoicism. You know, it promotes savings. It promotes fidelity. Yes. It, you know, yes, but that's does. a hard sell, self-reliance, uh, <laughs> right? Versus, yes. right? Inflation. What inflation is all about? Fabulous. You know, it's fabulous because the money's being printed like crazy, and we're going to invest it. And we're going to borrow lots of it, and we're going to open a disco, and it's going to be right. dancing twenty-four-seven, right? And it's just the economy. The, the bleeding edge of the American economy and the American culture is fabulousness fueled by unlimited credit and unlimited mm -hmm. money printing. Right. 
right? right. And that's what we see. I mean, we don't see but that. The- but that's what I like about about digital currency. You, you know, Bitcoin. that's no credit. That's your money going down. Unless your money going up, that's your money going down. Right, and but agree- again, again, that you're talking about a, a mindset there. That's what I would say. Stoic, I meant with spending. Right? And you so, know, how like do you you're sell spending, that? I see it it's, go. It's not going to be like Stoicism TV with Adam Curry. STV. Look at these Amish people. They're saving their milk, and so it doesn't go bad. We'll be no, back but, after the news with Kurt but, Loder. No, but but look at us right now. We are the living example of what can be done without, uh, you know, getting a big loan or venture capital. I'm living it now. I have no doubt that I, that, you know, either I build this business from the ground up, you know, it doesn't cost that much to get started these days and, uh, and it funds itself and it runs and we all can live and, and make something off of it. That's whatever's appropriate and we're happy or not. That's how it used to be with the business. Um, you know, I too have participated in the, let's go raise, you know, $50 million and we'll build it. Don't worry. We can always do a secondary, whatever, or, you know, a series B. So. Yeah, you know, that, what do you wind up with is big monoliths that suck. So, but I, I have a lot of faith in people. I really do. I have a lot of faith in the ingenuity. I think there's a lot of things that have happened while we've been shut down. Uh, a lot of bad things, negative things, but a lot of, I got very inspired. I got super inspired. This, this comes directly out of what's happening now in the world around us and the need to make it better. And I'm just doing it by example. You're doing it by example. So. You know, we just have to be careful that we're not all, you know, like what, what was the Danny Kay movie where they're locked in the room writing the encyclopedia of music for 20 years and then they wake up and they're still at the at the bongo drum uh, uh, section of the, of the encyclopedia and they wake up to jazz around them. They don't know what the hell has happened. We just have to make sure that we keep looking and oh, wait a minute, it's actually taking place. Are you having a hallucination right now? You really did <laughs> yes. drop the orange pill. <laughs> A Danny Kaye movie trapped in a room writing the encyclopedia. <laughs> Holy, we got to get out of this podcast. He, he did hey, look announced that for a question, long time. I have a question for you guys. Oh, uh, yeah, right. Um, uh, I have a friend who is, a, I call him the former New York banker, and uh, he has some theories about uh, the stimulus money. He claims, and I, and I believe him, that this is, um, uh, it has a term, immunized money that it actually is not inflationary as in inflationary to the money supply. And it's all part of the mystical modern monetary theory, and it's all going to be okay. And if anything, we're going to be like Japan. We just have to make sure we make more children. Right. That term immunization of money is popular in finance circles and economics. And it's a great way to um, distract and deflect attention away from (laughs) what are some ugly consequences of all that money printing. (laughs) Uh, for example, they'll say, like, we're, we're monetizing the debt, uh, oh, which that's a good we one, call yeah. quantitative easing. Every other yeah. uh, banana republic has gone down the shitter doing that exact same thing, but they didn't call it quantitative easing. Uh, so, since we've branded it as quantitative easing, we'll be, we're, we're, immune, we're immune from the effects of uh, currency collapse. And this is one of the things that financiers are great at doing, is by introducing language that is obscure in obfuscation from what they are doing. What you know, right. if you look at the Financial Times, they introduce almost on a weekly basis new terminology that's <laughs> essentially putting the same wine in the you know in old wine in a new bottle, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. It's just the mm-hmm. exact same scams that they rebrand in a different way. Look at the whole thing of in the nineteen eighties. It was green mail and corporate raiders. You know, green mail was a spin on blackmail. That's what happened in the 1980s. And then we had we had um, activist activist investors. Right, right, right. right, And and now we're having, you know, it's being it turned, you know, like Mitt Romney is not a green mailing corporate rating asshole. He's an activist (laughs) investor, you know. And so it's it's just you're constantly re, you know, upping the wordage and upping the language. What if if you could push all the buttons, um, what would you and I'll just say specifically for America, for the United States, what should we do? What would be the best thing to do? Given that there's, there's two, two, two answers to that question, A, using the current tools that we have now, or B, inventing new tools. So let's say using the current tools we have now without introducing any new laws and just with the levers that we have, the Etch-A-Sketch toy that we are working with, what can we do to fix it? And there mm-hmm. is only one answer. It's been the same answer now for decades. You need to raise interest rates. Because when you raise interest rates, you 
lower the cost of financial engineering. All the financial engineering that's like JP Morgan and Jamie Dimon, it's all based on being able to borrow money at 0%. If their right. borrowing costs go to 4 or 5% and interest rates are normalized, the 80, 90% of their criminal activity is wiped off the books. It's no longer <laughs> easy to do by raising 4%? Rates. Is that the target? 4 to 5% yeah. is a normalized rate. But- but the third thing to do is watch Orange Pill Podcast or listen to it on your favorite podcast app, including what's coming up from Adam Curry. And I want to say thank you so much for joining us here. And, you know, forget interest rates and rising interest rates because the fiat era is over. They just don't know it yet. Viva la Bitcoin! <laughs> Hello, España. España, the Max guys, the, the Stacy is a, is a Viva the Bitcoin. That would be really weird for John C. Dvorak if he just started speaking Spanish suddenly. He'd be like, what <laughs> is going on now? <laughs> awesome. All righty. All right. Well, that was a really interesting, I'm certain of it, interview with Adam Curry. Mm. Yeah, I love Adam Curry. You know, we've been friends for a while and get together whenever we can. And he really is the, the pod father, kind of invented podcasting. And he and John C. Dvorak do their uh, podcast now. The uh, It's called No Agenda. And mm-hmm. it's, uh, I listen to it often. It's got some great bits in there. And, uh, you know, he's a great guy. What can I, I say? Mostly, I mostly just listen to them when they do clips of us. And, you know, because they always play clips, they do a whole sequence of clips in their whole, you know, every every week they do an episode of No Agenda and they always do clips and comment on it. And I like it when they do it about me. I'm, I'm that sort of girl. You know, I was on a John C. Dvorak show he did called Silicon and Spin back in 1998, I believe it was. Wow. The clip is still on YouTube and I'm on a panel with two other folks and I have this uh, blonde. I was living in Los Angeles mm-hmm. and I, I had this three hundred and fifty dollar <laughs> haircut. Uh, with blonde hi- that, highlights. As you do, as you do. Yeah, and it looks terrible. <laughs> and I, I look really I know, I know messed you, up. I know this. you don't like to show those uh, clips to everybody on, on No, on those Twitter. are terrible. I mean, I sound okay and sound uh, smart and all, but I mean that that hair is like out of control. And Well, yeah. Okay. you know, that was the period of time when we had bad hair. Of cuts. course, Adam Curry had really interesting hair. <laughs> Back in the 1980s, if you look at back at his work, it's, uh, I guess, uh, kind of known for that extravagant mane of blonde. It was quite, quite beautiful. Of course, Orange Pills, Madge Weinstein, the bloated lesbian, she also did a, sh- a podcast for Adam Curry's uh, Serious, uh, po- at the pod show, it was called. And um, so there's a, like a whole like history. Uh, Madge also lived in, I think it was Rotterdam. She lived in um, the Netherlands, worked for Phillips for a while. And, um, you know, I'm thinking of doing a little segment every week, every, every week, like a different one. So we're going to do like a girl talk with um, Stacy and Madge segment. Okay. And then on the uh, next week, we'll have a boy talk <laughs> with Stacy and with Max and Madge. <laughs> Yeah, cool. I'd love to talk to Madge. You know. <laughs> so, what do you think about that? Like, we or, or we could just do it in the, each episode. Like, have you know, like um, Madge can turn. Like, you know, she's she's interesting. She's a complex lady, and uh, she could do boy talk as well as girl talk, and that's a powerful thing. But you uh-huh. know, <laughs> you don't want to sure. say anything. No. See, Max is a cis we'll white male, and he just shuts up. <laughs> Uh, and a Protestant, oh, like I'm, a piss I'm, I'm ready to go. You know, let me at it. I'm I'm anxious to have this this male to male conversation with Madge Weinstein, the bloated <laughs> lesbian. I'm, I can't wait. And you know what? Like, you know how we always love to end on a positive note, and that's why we usually end on the Abe Cambridge clip. And if we don't end on him, then you know it's like it's because he's sent us like a downer. But here is a really interesting look at um, well solar powered flying how to fly somewhere from point a to point b with solar powered technology on one of my appearances on on kaiser report last year i made some comments around the future of air travel being solar now i've I've noticed some people objected to this quite strongly on the grounds that the energy density of batteries makes it impossible to compete with the energy density of fuels now for those people i forgive you but i do recommend you take some orange pills So first off, just consider that just 120 years ago, there were no aircraft at all. And now at least pre-COVID, 
There's over a million people in the sky at any one time on aircraft that are quiet and safe and comfortable. You can watch movies and drink champagne at 42,000 feet. It's completely unprecedented if you went back 100 years ago. So think about what could be in 100 years time from now. But you don't actually, because you can look at the present. So my second point is there already are solar powered aircraft. The solar impulse a few years ago traveled around the world powered entirely by solar panels on its wings and they're already prototype other types of solar powered aircraft and that brings me to my third point i never said that the aircraft that could be solar powered would look anything like airplanes as we know today i envisage a world where we cross continents on slower moving luxury blimps de-riggables zeppelins of the future why do we need to rush to get places in discomfort? We're, we are all connected now. You could be on a solar power blimp, take a couple of days to get to where you need, but you're connected all the time. You could be socializing, you can be relaxing, and you're still connected to the internet. One thing that COVID has taught us is that we can work from home, we can be connected together. So why do we need to burn fuel to get places where we could be traveling in luxury and comfort? My own personal ambition is to have a liverboard solar powered blimp, a floating Winnebago, if you will. Now this is an aircraft that never needs to land. It has hydroponic systems on board, so you have your own food production and you can just cruise the skies forever in a borderless existence without any environmental impact. That is solar punk. Yeah, oh my God, you know, Abe is so far ahead of everybody else with real, practical, visionary technology, solar panel, dirigibles, or blimps traveling from the U.S. to Europe. You know, it might take two or three days. Well, of course, you're totally connected to the Internet. It's relaxing, tons of room, beautiful. Why not? This is such a great vision. It's all solar powered. And, uh, I th oh, man, it seems like it could be within reach, too. I envision an orange pill dirigible. I love that word dirigible, like blimp, right? Like an orange pill blimp. And Max and Stacy can, we, I'm sure it's easy to get a license, right? To fly a blimp. Oh, hell yeah. You can get those as easy as getting a boat license. You know, you just fill in your name, send them 10 bucks and you can fly a blimp. No problem. Those guys fly the new year blimp over the Super Bowl. They, they never got licensed or trained or anything. You know, the thing about blimps, of course, is that the Hindenburg kind yeah, of gave it a bad, bad rap. Yeah, you know, yeah. after the Hindenburg blew up, people were like, I don't want to hear nothing about no blimps and dirigibles and all that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. But now, uh, you know, it's time, time to bring them back. Well, I mean, they were blowing up like natural gas or hydrogen or something. Yeah, yeah. Like, I think it was hydrogen, you know, yeah. extremely flammable. Yeah, and, these are um, just solar panels. Yeah, it's run by solar panels, and obviously the technology has advanced since the Hindenburg. I'm not going to be the first person on this new <laughs> technology, but I'll certainly be in the second or third voyage. Well, I it really has given me visions. I didn't know this was an option, and I just would love to hang out in like up in a. Blimp. But those interiors looked awesome. They yeah, look that's like what I'm saying. David Geffen's yacht on the inside. Like Adam Curry, obviously, like he actually has. If you Google it, like how to set up your podcast studio, like exactly what, and it's even better than that. Like he tells you the hardware to get, the software to get, and the settings. Here's like, you could just import his settings. So you don't even have to know anything. Like you could be a total imbecile like myself and like, like he could figure it. Yeah, he and he also it. sells Adam Curry of the 80s costumes you can wear the same hair that and the that's same a good idea outfits that my, Adam my Curry hair is right now is while he was VJing at MTV uh and you can look uh, you can buy that look at adamcurry.com for 59.99 you can buy Adam Curry's look from MTV 1980 style including the hair wig and uh, I mean that right there is uh, pays for itself right because you're gonna yeah. It, yeah. it's a guaranteed um you know ratings booster you're going to immediately get more viewers, more listeners. It's, right. you know, you're a part of podcasting legend right there. I'm going to like, this is like Adam Curry's hair and, and the eighties on yeah, oh, MTV. Yeah. You know, it was like, like uh, it was like, it Bananarama. Was a, if you remember that group, I believe they were on MTV. They stole their hairdo from Adam Curry. This is it. Like, yeah, he was like, he was pretty, yeah, that looks pretty good. Yeah, so that's like Adam Curry, but he, he has some actually really great recommendations for the uh, whole setup to the podcast studio. And I might get his, um, you know, he likes the electro voice uh, mics. I might try that. These are the, the Joe Rogan 
uh, sure SM7Bs, but maybe we're going to try those ones that Madge Weinstein and Adam Curry use, and they, it's electro voice. It does that classic radio voice. Hi, this is the Orange Pill Podcast with Max and Stacy. We're coming to you from the studios of Orange Pill with news and information available now at Orange Pill Podcast. Please visit our Telegram group at t.me forward slash Orange Pill. This has been a message from Orange Pill Podcast. Orange Pill Podcast!